Hello, thank you for joining us for our program, Household Botany, Various Useful Plants in American Homes. Before we begin, I want to take a moment to thank the Cary Library Foundation. Their support enables us to bring programs like today's event to you. We are pleased to partner with the Lexington Historical Society who co-sponsored this event. Now I'd like to introduce our instructor. Judith Sumner is a botanist who specializes in ethnobotany, flowering plants, plant adaptations, and garden history. She has taught extensively both at the college level and at botanical gardens, including the Arnold Arboretum of Harvard University and Garden in the Woods. Judith graduated from Vassar College and completed graduate studies in botany at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. She studied at the Royal Botanic Gardens, Kew, and at the British Museum of Natural History and did extensive field work in the Pacific, Pacific region on the genus Pedosporum. She has published monographic studies in the American Journal of Botany, Pollen, Explorers, and Alertonia, as well as monographing two families for flora, I'm going to make the mistake of saying this incorrectly, in Vitiensis, no problem. Welcome, Judith. We are excited to get started. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. And thank you for coming today. Uh, today, we're going to talk about the ways that the earliest American settlers to the New World used plants in their homes. New World settlers traveled with plants. And just imagine what this would have been like if you were packing up to go to a new country and you didn't know what supplies you would be able to obtain. There were no shops, uh, there was no mail order, there was no Amazon.com. And so these women were bringing themselves, their families, their children, their newborns. In some cases, they would be having more children, they may have arrived pregnant, and they had to bring with them everything that they needed or they might need for the foreseeable future. And so what would they find in the new world? What did they bring with them from Europe? These are questions that we will answer today. The one universal truth is that many of them arrived with books. And this is fitting because we're in a library setting today. These were known as still room books. In some cases, they were manuscript volumes that women simply wrote out themselves as they acquired useful practical information. In other cases, they actually brought with them published books. And you can see one of them here. It's The English Housewife by Gervais Markham. The full, full title is The English Housewife, containing the inward and outward virtues which ought to be in a complete woman. And this was published in London in 1615 and went through multiple editions for the next century, many of which were brought with families here to Massachusetts. And of course, much of what was contained in the Markham book and other still room books was nothing more than the ancient European herbal tradition. Uh, the same herbs that you see in reconstructed herb gardens today, whether it's at a historic property close to Boston or Old Sturbridge Village or Plymouth Plantation, this is a tradition that actually goes all the way back to Dioscorides. Dioscorides was a Greek physician who worked for the Roman army and in the first century AD published a volume called De Materia Medica. That phrase, Materia Medica, persisted into the early 20th century, referring, referring to pharmaceutical drugs. In fact, early medical school textbooks from the 1910s actually were called Materia Medica. That was the, the name of the book on the spine. Uh, these are some illustrations from Dioscorides De Materia Medica. On the left, you see gallium, which is bed straw. The next two in green there on the left are wild geraniums. Over on the right, you see calendula. All of these were no medicinal plants at the time. He used them on Roman soldiers. That same tradition existed through the Middle Ages, through the Renaissance, and was brought here to New England. So the seeds and the roots and the little starting stems with rootlets hanging from them were in those bundles that our settlers were arriving with on the shores of Massachusetts. Kitchens and still rooms were the place where all of this herbal tradition persisted in the New World. 
Uh, these were the places where women dried herbs. If you don't dry herbs and take care of them very carefully and keep them from getting mold, the chemistry will change. And so drying was very important. Uh, stills were important as well. Uh, stills were expensive. You can see there on the right, uh, that's a big copper apparatus. That would have been pricey. And very often in a given town, a given village or community, there were only one or two stills. A still allows you to separate the essential oil of a medicinal plant from the water-based chemistry of the medicinal plant. You basically uh, take the plant, pound it into a slurry, boil that slurry, and the oils will boil off at a lower temperature than the water. And so the oils are then collected from uh, the long piper, uh, copper piping, and uh, those were used medicinally. These are the same essential oils that have become popular just in the last few years. Uh, they are very potent. Uh, they actually can be extremely toxic. Uh, we've perhaps all heard of cases where where a misguided young woman just in the last few years have used essential oils from peppermint instead of peppermint flavoring and nearly poisoned their families. Uh, we know that, for instance, the essential oil from lavender will cause men and boys to develop breasts. And so these are very potent, uh, but these were used medicinally. And in some cases, uh, the dose, of course, was important. A very small dose could be medicinal. Anything higher can be quite toxic. Uh, keep in mind that many of the weeds that we have in New England actually were introduced as medicinal plants. And I think you recognize every one of these probably from having to extirpate these from your lawn, right? Uh, upper left, plantain. Uh, upper right, uh, ale hoof, gill over the ground or ground ivy. Uh, below it, lower right, chickweed. Uh, over on the lower left, uh, oxalis. Um, and uh, sorrel, also known as sorrel. All of these were medicinal plants with weedy growth native to Europe. They were brought over here, and lo and behold, they became weeds in the New England population. All of these, by the way, fall into what I consider the try something category of medicine. Uh, these were plants that women could find by just stepping out of their dooryards, and they could be made into teas, or flavorings, or poultices, or ointments. And uh, did any of them work? Well, I don't know. Upper right, uh, that one is a mint. We know it's chemically pretty active. I'll talk more about that one in a bit. Uh, lower left, sorrel has a lemon flavoring. And the Elizabethans loved lemon, couldn't always get their hands on an imported lemon. And so sorrel with its high oxalic acid content did for lemon. The plantain in the upper right and the chickweed, not so much. Probably just made a nice green ointment. Um, not particularly effective. We often want to think that early housewives tried every plant in a systematic way. Well, we'll try this. We have something, we'll try this. And they kept careful notes. Nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, we now know from ethnobotany that the plants that people tended to try are the plants that stood out in the environment, what anthropologists often call salient plants. So here are several salient plants. Mullen on the left, big, robust plant. It's a biennial. Year one, it makes the rosette of leaves. Year two, the thing bolts. Up comes this big thing of flowers, dense, densely hairy leaves. You just want to pick one up and feel it. Lo and behold, this is a salient plant. This is one that was used primarily for breathing. To open up airways, the leaves were also used as poultices. An entire leaf poached in milk, put on a wound, would, would keep a wound clean. Upper right, same kind of thing. Uh, lamb's ears, lamb's quarters, uh, hairy, a little bit juicy, a little succulent. You just want to touch it. And those were used medicinally for similar purposes. Lower right, um, you recognize hens and chicks. It's a sedum. We grow, grow it now as a rock garden plant. It's kind of a cute plant, right? It's juicy. You just want to go and touch it. It was a poor man's aloe. If you couldn't afford what we used to call Socatrine aloe, basically from the island of Socatra, it's an African plant. You know, it's an import. It was kind of hard to get your hands on it. You at least could grow hens and chicks. And the most common place to grow them was actually in a thatched roof. That's why there's a little thatched cottage in there in the inset. 
A woman could just step outside, reach into the thatched roof, get a handful of hens and chicks, bring it in, and put it on a rash, you know, open the leaves. They were juicy, they were soothing. Put the liquid on a leaf, uh, from the leaf on a wound or on a burn, and uh, you were ready to go. So these are salient plants. You know, they have some physical attribute and you just want to sort of get involved with them at some level. And then refining this a little bit further, we also had the doctrine of signatures. The doctrine of signatures was a sort of a thought process that originated in Asia in ancient times, was carried by explorers and visitors from Asia to Europe, and then into England, eventually actually into the New World. And the doctrine basically says, if we just look at a plant, the plant is going to tell us what its uses might be. So all we have to do is read the sign, find the signature. So over on the left there, you see foxglove. Notice it's got some little spots on it. What could they mean? Over on the right, we have uh, lungwort. We've got spots on the leaves. What could this mean? Well, what tissue in the human body is spotty looking? It's the lung. And so these were used for ailments of the lung. Now, is there any validity? Is there any truth to this at all? No, of course not. It's utter nonsense. But every now and then it actually worked just by sheer coincidence. But I can assure you that there is no overlap between the evolution of the plants with these various traits and the evolution of human physiology. Those two just simply do not overlap in biology. But something like foxglove, which regulated heartbeat, if you had congestive heart failure and your lungs were filling with fluid, this could bring you around. And so that is what kept the doctrine of signatures alive and well, is that some of the time through sheer coincidence it actually worked. We'll look at some more here. So these are plants that are shaped like the human liver, liverwort on the top, and that's a bryophyte, it's a relative of a moss. Uh, it has lobing, a little bit like a liver. Um, Lower right, uh, I mean, lo lower image, that's liver leaf, uh, pretty close relative of a buttercup, actually. And it also has lobed leaves. Were these effective in treating ailments of the liver? No, but people use them nevertheless because they believed in the doctrine of signatures. And in some cases, it may even have been a panacea. You know, you convince yourself it's going to work, and by Jove, it does seem to work. Um, wild pansies known, were known as heart's ease. Notice how often the doctrine is reflected actually in the common name and sometimes even in, in the Latin name like hepatica for the liver leaf. Uh, so look at heart's ease. The lowermost petal right there is shaped like a heart. It actually has a little double lobe and that's actually the petal where the pollinating insect lands and you have these pollinating pollinator marks here that are showing the insect where the nectar is and uh, this was used for ailments ailments of the heart did it work no uh more examples uh something like a walnut shaped like a brain must be good for the brain well i mean of course walnuts are good for the brain right you know maybe no more so than other proteins but you know can't hurt uh top right adiantum the maiden hair fern uh the uh, the stem, we call it the rachis, on which the leaflets are attached, is black and wiry, looks like a really healthy black hair, must be good for human hair, says it really? No. Uh, anything with a bright eye, uh, those were known as eye brights, must be good for eyesight, is it really? No. Uh, anything with a kind of scrofulous, scruffy looking skin, must be good for skin wounds, dry skin, does it work? No. Uh, and then, of course, you bring this mindset to the New World and they start finding new plants in North America. That is the pitcher plant that occurs in bogs all over, all over North America. Notice that when the pitcher plant is in the bright sun, you start getting a venation pattern showing up. Bright red anthocyanin and pigments begin to express themselves. It was immediately assumed this must be good for treating ailments of the blood and circulation, and it is not. But, but they used it because they were convinced it might be useful. Uh, nerve roots, these were the wild orchids. And notice the long lines through the leaves. These used to be common. 
Uh, there used to be areas in upstate New York where you could see fields of these so-called nerve root orchids. They have now been collected into near extinction. If you want to see one in New England, you have to go to garden in the woods in the spring, and then you can see them. These became known as a plant to calm the nerves from melancholia, for any kind of mental illness, crazy behavior, and they were actually put in the capsules, in the medicines that were sold by medicine shows. And these were literally driven into near extinction, based again on the doctrine of signatures. I don't think they were affected. Some other interpretations of native New England plants. Uh, so this is bloodroot, sanguinaria canadensis. So sanguine, meaning blood. It actually contains an antibiotic alkaloid called sanguinarine. Uh, the idea of bloodroot, though, comes from the underground stem, the rhizome. If you dig it up, it does look kind of red. You crack it open, and out will seep a bright red latex. This plant is actually in the poppy family. Like many poppy relatives, it does produce a potent alkaloid, which is antibiotic. Um, it does seem to have some side effects. Uh, people did start putting this into spring tonics. They drank a lot of it. There are anecdotal reports that the sanguinarine causes tunnel vision, probably not something that's good. Uh, it also was used, by the way, in a mouthwash that was marketed until fairly recently. It was called Viadent. Sanguinarine kills oral bacteria, uh, including the streptococcus that caused tooth decay. Uh, I don't think, I don't know of any medical products right now, mainstream medical products that contain sanguinaria. Uh, another New England plant that was found in a, many homes was um, bone set. And look at bone set. Do you see that the leaves are actually fused across the stem? So the document of signatures interpretation for bone set was that it actually would cause bones to heal. So now in some books, some field guides, you'll read that bone set was used for broken bones. That's actually not true. Bone set was really used for a disease known as break bone fever. Break bone fever now has the modern name dengue fever. And dengue was not well distinguished from malaria. So there was much dengue fever and much malaria all throughout New England. We don't think of this as being a big dengue fever and malarial area right now because we have drained the swamps. But this shows you, you know, this dark red here shows you where dengue was and pretty much it's the same for malaria. And uh, these diseases are transmitted by mosquitoes. Malaria is actually a little plasmodium. It's a, it's a cell. Dengue is a virus, but they are both transmitted by mosquito vectors. Any place where mosquitoes can breed, you can end up with these diseases. So uh, break bone fever, dengue fever was so painful, you felt your bones were breaking. So if you ate a plant where it looked like the leaves had fused, you would be cured. Amazingly, it does actually seem to work. It's pretty effective and was used extensively for both dengue fever and malaria during the Civil War, particularly in the American South, where they did not have a good resource for quinine. All the quinine uh, was, was going to uh, soldiers in the North. So the doctrine of signatures sort of got pushed to some extremes. Uh, sometimes it was really guilt by association. So on the top left, if you had a plant that was growing in a crack, uh, housewives interpreted that as, well, this must be good for breaking up stones. Oh, it must be good for breaking up kidney stones or, or bladder stones, okay? Uh, if you had a, a moss or some other little creeping plant growing on a skull, uh, that was known as muscus ex cranio humano. If you could scrape off that moss, it would be good for your head. Uh, over on the left-hand side, um, at the bottom there, you see a plant that lacks chlorophyll. It is a little parasitic orchid. Uh, it is growing on dead or dying organic material in the soil. Uh, something like that must be good for cancers, which are sort of parasitic diseases. All of that is medicinal and botanical nonsense. But then over on the right, 
Um, willow, let's think about willow. Well, that is a plant that grows in damp areas. Uh, dampness is associated with rheumatic pains and arthritis. So if we just made a willow tea, that would work. Um, it turns out it does because the chemistry of willow is very close to the chemistry of, of aspirin. Uh, salicylic acid becoming acetyl salicylic acid. And so that's why there's an aspirin bottle right there. It was basically how the household equivalent of aspirin. And coincidentally, another plant in New England uh, that uh, women learned about from Native Americans was wintergreen. And wintergreen, and the uh, little insect there on the lower right, uh, has a very similar chemistry. And uh, basically, poached in water uh, is a mild analgesic that will help to get rid of headaches and arthritic pains. I think one of the most interesting examples of doctrine of signatures is one that began uh, in the Mediterranean region, was carried into uh, the rest of Europe and England, has then been carried to the New World, and is still alive in the coal mining areas of Pennsylvania. So this involves Queen Anne's lace. Now, Queen Anne's lace is all over. So you know, you, if you looked at it, say this summer, you still have some around in your yard. In the center of each flower cluster of Queen Anne's lace, you find a few red flowers, deep red maroon flowers. Now, the legend one about Queen Anne's lace was that Queen Anne was making lace with a bobbin. She poked herself with the bobbin, and blood got on the lace. Okay, good. But the doctrine of signatures interpretation was, hmm, red looks like blood, must be the sign of no pregnancy. And that was what women, what women went with. And uh, they began to use Queen Anne's lace, particularly, so most people call them the seeds. I can tell you it was a botanist. They're actually the fruits. Those are the fruits. They're very tiny. Uh, they gr grow in this head up here when the uh, flower cluster dries it sort of closes up and if you just open up that head out spill all these little dry fruits one made per flower and if if you ingest these um, it was thought that that would in fact prevent a pregnancy um, and why do i have a picture of a carrot here you're wondering uh, because because this is nothing more than a wild carrot uh, if you pull up queen anne's lace and you have my permission to do this. It's a weed. It's not a native New England wildflower that we must protect. But if you pull it up, you will observe that the taproot is nothing more than a small yellow carrot. And it's actually the same species, Daucus carota, as the uh, cultivated domesticated carrots uh, from the local supermarket. So this was actually a tradition that went all the way back to the ancient Greek and Romans, um, women ingesting uh, the seeds, so actually the fruits of these wild carrots, Queen Anne's lace, to prevent pregnancy. Uh, there was also a related plant. I cannot show you an actual picture of it. It was Sylphion or Sylphium. It was driven into extinction um, in ancient times. It was basically a six foot tall version of the wild carrot, of the Queen Anne's lace. Uh, it is embossed on some Roman coins. It's described in some Roman um, poetry. Uh, we know it also was ingested to prevent pregnancies. Does this work? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, Queen Anne's lace actually produces terpenoids that block the synthesis of progesterone. And uh, in some of the coal mining communities, um, this is still used. Uh, and uh, you can actually find a web, do not try this, right? Uh, but there are women who do follow some websites that are on the internet uh, that tell you how to practice birth control using, uh, using Queen Anne's lace. And there's one other thing I want to say. Notice how similar this is to a little bird's nest. There were also a whole bunch of little stories about supposedly miniature birds that lived inside these little dried up flower clusters of Queen Anne's lace. That's all a myth. There are not little birds that live inside of those. But something that we have discovered fairly recently, just within the last decade or two, is that birds in nature 
often collect the leaves of certain plants. One of them is Queen Anne's lace, and they use those leaves to line their nests. And so I kind of suspect that the little bird myths that cropped up came from people who observed birds collecting the leaves of Queen Anne's lace. Now, why do birds do this? Uh, this actually has nothing to do with House Silvani, but I'll mention it anyway. There is another field of science called zoopharmacology, and it, it relates to the use of medicinal plants by wild animals. And it turns out that some of the same chemicals that are in Queen Anne's lace uh, that are involved with uh, birth control will also kill mites, the same little mites that can suck a baby bird, literally dry of its blood. And so by lining the nests with the fresh leaves. It was basically a, a little insectus, I guess mites aren't technically insects, but it was a little way to get rid of pests that were there living, living inside a bird's nest. Moving on. Uh, now, women arriving here in New England were looking for one plant in nature as the single most important plant that they could find. Uh, if you've seen the Harry Potter movie, uh, where the herbalist pulls the plant out of the pot and the root of the plant actually begins to scream. That is the plant in question, that's the one we're going for. That is mandrake. And this is the one plant that women really hope they would find growing here in the new world. So it has a doctrine of signatures interpretation. Uh, the branched taproot of mandrake is so branched that it sort of looks like a human torso. And the plant was interpreted as being a panacea cure anything. It would just cure any problem you had. Uh, it was considered such a valued plant that myths were really encouraged among uh, the rhizotomi, the root collectors in ancient Europe, so that, you know, you really should be afraid of the root. If you disrupt it, it will scream, you will die. And so a, a dog was attached to the plant, and then the dog would pull the plant and the death dealing shriek from the plant might kill the dog, but not you, because you have stuck cotton in your ears. Uh, you can see from these illustrations, the woodcuts, how mandrake was drawn in herbals from the Renaissance. And this is the plant we wanted to find. This is what the plant actually looks like. It's Mandragora officinarum, mandrake. It's actually in the nightshade family which is the potato, tomato, petunia, eggplant family. But there's also a branch of the family that is quite potent in terms of its alkaloid chemistry. Uh, mandrake contains the tropane alkaloids, uh, which all have this you know, little unique structure right here. And you can see what the actual taproot looks like. You know, it is sort of suggestive of a human body with a little bit of imagination. Uh, what was it used for? Uh, it was used often in childbirth. And uh, that mixture of tropane alkaloids would knock you out. And it was a very powerful analgesic. And uh, would it surprise you to hear that if you've heard of twilight sleep, twilight sleep uh, became popular in Germany during the 1920s. It was promoted by the Nazi regime to encourage women to have a lot of children in or out of wedlock, basically based on the tropane alkaloids from mandrake and related plants. Uh, twilight sleep was no longer used in this country by the 1960s. It had disappeared. It at first was something used by wealthy women, and by the end it was in uh, inner city hospitals that treated poor patients. But some other plants that have these same alkaloids, allow me to digress briefly here. Uh, this may or may not have been in your household, depending on whether or not you practice witchcraft. Uh, but on the upper right there, you see an illustration of henbane. And uh, henbane is hyoscyamus, and it was a plant strongly associated with the practice of witchcraft. The mixture of tropane alkaloids and henbane, which is, by the way, in the same family, the nightshade family, the potato, tomato, petunia, eggplant family, um, the mixture of alkaloids in these plants would put you into a dreamlike sleep during which you saw fire and flames. And this was associated with witchcraft. Um, 
I'm such a prude, I can barely even tell you how this was applied, but I'm going to pull myself together and tell you the leaves were smashed into tallow fat and reduced to a green slimy ointment, and this was rubbed into the female genitalia. And um, this is what basically created the sensations of witchcraft. And by the way, if you've ever wondered why many old New England homes have juniper shrubs outside the door. I know the house I grew up in, one town away, we had junipers, big junipers on either side of the front door when I was a child. Junipers were thought to keep the witches away. And so they have nothing to do with him. So the antidote, the spiritual antidote to him. Uh, and then there was a little incident um, here in North America involving another relative of this plant. Uh, so this is Datura stramonium, also known as jimson weed. Uh, jimson weed has quite a range. It really is a South American plant. It came up into Central America, and there is some wild jimson weed here, even here in New England, but there's a lot of it in the South. And you have perhaps seen it. It has a, a sort of a green capsule that is juicy when not quite ripe. When they're ripe, they sort of dry and open. But, you know, if you've been out, say, if, say you wore a red coat, and you were out doing maneuvers and it's hot and dry and you return and you're looking for something to eat. These do contain tropine, tropane alkaloids and they should not be ingested. Uh, here's an account of what happened in Virginia in 1705. I won't read you the whole thing, but we'll start right about here. So these men ate, ate the fruits of jimson, jimson weed, Another stark naked was sitting in a corner like a monkey, grinning and making moles, grimaces at them. A fourth would finally kiss and paw his companions and sneer in their faces. In this frantic condition, they were confined, lest they should in their folly destroy themselves. And this went on for seven days, and after 11 days, returned themselves again, not remembering anything that had passed. So these tropane alkaloids uh, were powerful indeed. Um, True mandrake, though, was not to be found uh, in the New World. And instead, uh, housewives exploring botanically found this plant, which became known as New World mandrake, uh, or mayapple. It's Podophyllum peltatum. Uh, it is not related to the Old World mandrake. It does have kind of a taproot that's branched. Uh, they found out from Native Americans that it was used for warts and supposed cancers. Now, were these really cancers? We don't know because we don't have a biopsy to hand, but it turns out that, in fact, uh, the resin uh, that can be isolated from the roots uh, does have anti-cancer activity, and uh, it is now the basis for a semi-synthetic chemotherapeutic drug known as etoposide that actually will stop cancer cells from dividing, and um, that is used in um, several cancers. It's used in the most rare form of uh, testicular cancer. I think Scott Hamilton used etoposide. Um, I believe it's also used in small cell lung cancers and some of the peanut cancers. Uh, another plant that they tried to find here in New England was the Old World Bay Laurel. So in your herb or spice cabinet, if you have laurel uh, bay, bay leaves that you put in soup or stews, this is the plant. Um, does that grow here in New England? No. Uh, they found uh, Camellia latifolia, um, also it was known as calico plant. Um, looked like the closest thing. Um, it is actually quite toxic, uh, so that was not satisfactory. It was known as mountain laurel. You know it is mountain laurel. Uh, the plants are so toxic that even honey made from the flowers of mountain laurel uh, is quite toxic, so that did not work out. But then using what we think of as the scratch and sniff method of plant identification, uh, settlers found uh, sassafras. And uh, sassafras is actually in the same family as uh, bay laurel. And it has a similar, very resinous, terpene-like smell, a lot of essential oils. Uh, it contains a highly carcinogenic oil called saffron. And so you know, we've all heard of sassafras tea. Not really a good thing to ingest. I don't advocate that. It's the same family that includes uh, cinnamon. Uh, early
early uh, in New World exploration, it was considered sort of a substitute for cinnamon, and a lot of it was exported to Europe for a while. Sassafras was the single greatest export from New England back to Europe. Uh, it became known as a fountain of life, that if you ingested sassafras bark or powdered sassafras bark, you would live forever. Uh, that, that does not seem to be true. Uh, but then it became associated with venereal diseases. And the venereal diseases um, was really its undoing because people did not want to be associated with needing a drug for venereal disease, so that sort of ended the popularity of sassafras. But the big sailing ships coming over from Europe would return carrying logs, entire tree trunks from sassafras. And of course, it is a it is a plant that sort of demands attention. It's one of these salient plants because it actually makes four different kinds of leaves. And you can see some of those leaves right here. So it makes leaves with no lobe, just an oval leaf. It makes leaves with a left-handed lobe. It makes leaves with a right-handed lobe. So like a left-handed mitten, a right-handed mitten. And then it makes leaves with two lobes, like a two-thumbed mitten, like the kind I would knit if I knit. Uh, so um, it was obvious in the environment. It became sort of a familiar household plant. Sassafras tea is sort of a cure-all, not the safest thing in the world to really ingest. I want to talk a little bit specifically about the mint family, because so many of the plants that were used in American homes were in the mint family. So this is rosemary, uh, Ross Marinus officinalis. And whenever you see that epithet officinalis or officinarum, that tells you that this had an early medicinal use. So uh, this was another multi-purpose plant. It was used uh, certainly as a culinary herb. Uh, it was used for teas. It was used externally, supposedly, to alleviate paralysis. Um, it does have some antibiotic quality to it, uh, and it will kill some bacteria. The essential oils that you find in the mint family are actually packaged in surface hairs. So on the right, you can see these hairs. That's a scan electron micrograph. And you can actually see the hairs growing up from the epidermal cells. This happens to be peppermint methopiperita. You bite into it, and you get a mouthful of these strong tasting essential oils. This is basically the plant's line of defense against insects and other herbivores. An herbivore walking up to this plant, trying to bite it, is going to get a mouthful of these hairs, if, if the hairs don't discourage you, the taste that they deliver will probably drive away uh, the animal that's trying to eat the plant. Another member of the mint family is that little ground, ground ivy we saw before, one of the weedy ones. And this was one of these, you know, try something, try anything plants. You had it growing outside your doorway. You could just go out there and here are the instructions for an anonymous cure for lunacy. Get three handfuls of this plant, boil them in white wine, mix with the best salad oil, boil it, pulverize it. Now you have a nice green ointment and rub it onto the patient's shaved head. Now, will this bring somebody out of some sort of a lunatic fit? Um, you know, it might get somebody calmed down. Uh, again, this is a plant that does have some antibiotic function. It might not be a broad spectrum antibiotic, but it will kill some bacteria. But you know, I, I think having it in the oil and the wine and having it rubbed in your head might in fact calm the patient down. And there were all sorts of little booklets like this that became available, a collection of about 300 receipts in cookery, physic, and surgery. This was basically sort of a junior version of one of these still room books. And you know, these are just, just things women could try if, if they needed a cure for something more than that. Uh, the thing that's interesting about ground ivy is that it has a tendency to kill other plants. And when it gets in a cemetery, it really takes over. And it's amazing how many country cemeteries that you visit. And you know, between the headstones, you don't see grass anymore. You see this little ground ivy. And so it became known as a plant that basically would wipe out other plants. So it must have a little bit of witchcraft associated with it. Actually, in botany, it's a characteristic we call allelopathy, the ability to kill other plants. There are many plants that are allelopathic. Norway maples are allelopathic. You know, Norway maples will kill other plants. Um, sage will kill other plants. And this little grand ivy will kill other plants. 
The, this little ground ivy became known as a plant associated with witchcraft. It became associated with midsummer, midsummer night, and a little witchy activity, and the crafting of wreaths to wear at midsummer night. And that's what you see over there on the right. Bee balm is a member of the mint family. Uh, and here in New England, bee balm is remembered as one of the Liberty Tea Herbs. So after the Boston Tea Party, and true patriots did not want to drink brews of imported tea, they started looking around for other plants that would release, you know, flavors in boiling water, and uh, bee balm was one of them. This is a familiar perennial plant in many people's gardens. There are yellow versions, there are pink versions, the wild ones are red. It contains a compound called thymol. Thymol also occurs in thyme, which you see below over here, both bee balm and thymol, can, and th thyme contain thymol, and thymol is a pretty potent antibiotic. It will, it will cure a sore throat. Many sore throats can be cured with thymol. And so this became known not only as an alternate to imported tea, but also as a nice herb for people with bad colds and sore throats. Uh, Tussilago farfara is a different family. This now we're talking a little bit about some composites. This is the daisy family. So when you look at a composite flower, one of these, it actually is not one flower. It's a cluster of flowers that basically looks like one flower kind of fools the pollinating insect into coming in, you're visiting a flower, not really, you're visiting probably a hundred flowers, so that's okay, they don't care. Uh, it's an efficiency mechanism for effective pollination. This was one that was brought from Europe, we call it coltsfoot. If you take the leaves of coltsfoot and you pulverize them, you basically get a slime, a demulcent, and that slime really soothes a sore throat. And it will soothe cracked skin and this sort of thing. And so this was brought over. It was widely used in Europe. In fact, this was actually the, the symbol that herb shops used in pre-literate Europe, you know, the same way that you have uh, like a golden tooth, a golden molar, or you have a barber pole. This was the sign of the herb shop, a little yellow daisy, the flower of colt's foot. Pulverize the plant, you get this nice demulcent goo that can be used to soothe a sore throat or sore skin. Uh, this plant is pretty common now to the extent that in some areas it actually is invasive. It grow, tends to grow in wet ditches. Uh, another member of the composite family is yarrow. Uh, this is also all over the place. It is naturalized in New England. Uh, this contains over 100 bioactive compounds. It causes blood vessels to constrict, and so it stops bleeding. It is a hemostat and was a valuable plant to have. And there are cultivated versions of this now. Uh, every now and then in nature, a pink one shows up. And if you breed a pink with a pink, you get a brighter pink. And so you get these, these yellow and pink versions of Achillea that are derived from the, the wild flower. Uh, tansy, another composite. Tansy is a little different because it only has the disc. It doesn't have the petals, but it also is a member of the composite family, it contains a compound called thujone. Thujone is quite toxic. A high dose of thujone can send you into a fit that looks like epilepsy. A lesser dose, uh, a small dose, is flavorful. Uh, these were actually used, the leaves of tansy were used for flavoring the seed cakes associated with Lent. A moderate dose will kill parasitic worms. And uh, that's what this is, that word vermifuge. That's a medicine that expels parasitic worms. That mother is holding a bouncing baby who has been rid of its parasitic worms using Dr. Jane's tonic vermifuge. Uh, many of those vermifuges that were sold over the counter contained tansy, or mothers would mix up their own, and you had to be careful because the effective dose to expel the worm was very close to the toxic dose for the infant. And what is it with this, this obsession with worms? Well, just think about how children lived. You had your dooryard. The children were in the dooryard. 
They were sitting, I hesitate to say soil, they were sitting in the dirt. You had your little hands going from the dirt into the mouth, and you also had animals walking through the dooryard. So, right, you can just imagine that a good deworming had to occur annually, and good mothers did that. And speaking of herbs that were used by mothers, one of the most single most important of these was the opium poppy. Now, those of us of a certain age will recall laudanum and paragaric, and you can see a couple of the labels there. So, um, I'm 72. Uh, I grew up in Arlington down the road, and um, I remember paragaric. The mothers all had paragaric. Uh, paragaric is a tincture of opium uh, in alcohol, as is laudanum but then paragaric was flavored with camphor. And it was really made for children. And it was for teething children and cranky children and children who needed to be put to bed. And uh, mothers could buy it, but I believe you had to sign for it. I believe you had to sign for it. Uh, it was called a controlled narcotic. Controlled, narcotic controlled narcotic. Well, I'm sure it was controlled. You had to sign for it. And it should be controlled, right. Uh, what does it actually come from? So up at the top there, you see the flower of the opium poppy. Um, the opium poppy produces a latex. Uh, members of the poppy family produce latex, and it's basically a liquid that it does in fact contain latex, but it also contains some potent alkaloids. Um, if you cut the poppy capsule, the latex drips out. Uh, the same chemicals are present in the seeds of the opium poppy even just in the dried stems, leaves, and capsules. Uh, and that is often known as the poppy straw. And if you just boil the, leaves, the dead leaves and the dead stems, you can get out uh, the opium alkaloids. Uh, probably the best known of these is morphine, and there are about 19 other potent alkaloids uh, that are known for their analgesic effects. Um, some women grew their own opium poppy well into the 19th century. So here's a little list of herbs for sale in 1868, I believe. Uh, so let's see, what do we have here? About, half, about halfway down, we have henbane, right? That was dangerous. Um, go down a little further, we have opium poppy. Go down a little further toward the bottom, we have tansy. And I'm not going to talk about wormwood today, but wormwood has some of, the, some of the same chemistry as tansy, and that was the herb that was used in making absinthe, which might have been in some American homes. So I can talk about absinthe today, but that was dangerous stuff too. But anyway, you could grow your own opium poppy. Um, or you could buy these commercial soothing syrups, Mrs. Winslow's being one of the best known, the mother's friend for children teething, or children who just need to go to bed, I will add. Or you could mix up your own. So that's the frontispiece from The Family Nurse by Lydia Maria Child, 1837. If you read that, she says, you know, basically get, gather the poppy straw, poach it in water. Um, now you're not going to know the strength of this, right? How much water, how much straw, when were the plants collected, how much opium do they contain? And so she says, be careful when administering. That's some very sage advice, <laughs> right? Uh, the mustard family. Uh, strongly antibiotic. Um, one mustard that was brought from Europe was a horseradish. Uh, these were used in so many different ways. They were used to enhance appetite. They were used to make mustard plasters and poultices. Uh, they are known. They are known antibiotics. Uh, they are known blistering agents. If you get enough um, mustard oils from the leaves of these plants on the skin, it will cause blisters to erupt 
And that was thought to sh show that disease was being expelled from the body. Uh, it's the same family as cabbage down here. If you get an old cabbage, you can sometimes taste that sharpness in some of the older leaves, and those are the mustard oils. And the reason there is a World War I photograph of gassed men down there in the corner is that these were indeed the chemical basis of the synthetic mustard oils uh, that were used as chemical warfare uh, during, uh, during uh, the First World War. Uh, additional mustards were introduced to New England. It was a big family. The single worst is the garlic mustard. Uh, people liked it because it had a little bit of a garlic flavor, garlic scent too, and it could be turned into poultices and it was used as a culinary herb. The problem is this plant has become so highly invasive here in New England uh, just by happenstance that it has wiped out entire populations of native wildflowers. And the problem is that it can grow virtually in the dark. It really needs so minimal sunlight. And I know some towns around Boston now are having mustard pulling days. Uh, in the spring, when this thing starts to sprout, people go out and try to pull it up out of the local forests, which is a good thing to do. Uh, so we've talked quite a bit about medicinal plants, and we've hinted a little bit about me many culinary plants. And that's because many culinary herbs and medicinal herbs were really the same, same exact plants. It was just a matter of how much was used. A bigger dose for a medicine, a slightly lesser dose, and it became a culinary herb. Uh, I want to talk now uh, about some more really specific aspects of culinary botany uh, in early American homes. Um, and we're really going to be starting with pickling. So uh, just to start with, a few cookbooks. Amelia Simmons on the right, the American cook, generally credited with being the first American cookbook published here, 1796. Over on the left, the Virginia Housewife, that was by Mary Randolph. She was a cousin of Thomas Jefferson. That's a Southern book. And you start looking at that and you see a lot more spicy foods than you see here in New England because it was drawing from the uh, English colonial tradition of curries and this sort of thing from abroad. Uh, the American Frugal Housewife. This is by Lydia Child, the same woman that suggested being careful with the opium doses with the infants. This was a frugal book, 1833, followed a few years later by Sarah Josepha Hales, the good housekeeper. She was a little bit more upmarket, widely regarded as the mother of the American Thanksgiving. Now, what do all of these American cookbooks have in common? And the answer is pickling. If you look through them, they all discuss pickling using a lot of herbs and spices, even the New England books, which tend to be very bland, cookery, light on herbs and spices, um, you know, followed up by the, the Graham teachings of William Sylvester Graham that a lot of spices led to heightened sexual activity, so they must be avoided. But when you were pickling, you needed to use herbs and spices for their antibiotic function. Uh, the basis of pickling here in New England really pivoted on the apple because apples were used to make cider and then cider, if you leave it alone and open to the air, will ferment, right, because the yeast will fall in and you get ethanol and then if it's left open to the air and not boiled or sterilized or pasteurized or anything like that, in the fall, acetic acid bacteria, again, just from the air, and the cider will go from being hard cider with ethanol, alcohol, and up to becoming apple cider vinegar. And this happened in the cider barrels. And you always knew when the acetic acid bacteria had done their work, and we now had acetic acid, in other words, apple cider vinegar, for two reasons. First of all, it smelled like vinegar. It tasted like vinegar. And you start to see slime. And this is called the mother. And there she is right there. And that's a whole bunch of these rod-shaped acetic acid bacteria clinging together. They make a little gelatinous coat. And so you get this, these blobs of this gelatin. This even happens if you buy apple cider vinegar from the supermarket and you don't use it all up 
you might see this sort of gelatinous blob floating around in the bottom, and that is the mother. So this was the basis of pickling. Without apple cider vinegar, we would not have had pickles here in the New World. In the Old World, the vinegar came from wine. It was wine vinegar. Here in the New World, it was apple or apple cider vinegar. Now, what was actually pickled? It would be easier for me to say what was not pickled. You know, if you were standing there and you were organic and you came out of the garden or we shot you, we could pickle you, right? So we, we always think of pickles, we think of cucumbers. And cucumbers were pickled indeed, right? But then we get some really rare plants that were pickled. This was something called a martinia or a martino. If you look it up in some of those cookbooks, it, martinia became martino. And it's a devil's claw and it's an ibicella, it's a tibonus, and it's actually an African plant, it's a vine, which when the fruit was ripe, it looked like this, not too appetizing with these big thorns on it. And it was a dispersal mechanism. Um, an animal would come and you know, step on this thing. Uh, the claw would kind of wedge over its hoof, and then the animal would go gallop galloping away. You know, picture a zebra with this thing impaled on its foot, and then the seeds would be dispersed by the ungulate, whatever it is that's running away. But the unripe fruit, fruits look like little apricots, and these were picked and pickled, and Martino pickles. And these show up in these early cookbooks, and people wonder, what in the world is a Martino? And the answer is it's a little apricot fruit of these strange African vines, and people would get the seed and plant it and then get the fruits and pickle them. Um, another unexpected pickle uh, was made from uh, the little fruits of the nasturtium. Uh, nasturtium is not technically in the mustard family, but it does make mustard oils. And uh, these were an inexpensive substitute for the imported caper, and not a bad thing to serve with meat. Um, people grew um, the hibiscus relative known as okra. And we usually think of that as a southern plant. There was plenty of okra, though, that was grown in New England, and those pods were pickled. Uh, citron melons were pickled. Uh, so a citron melon is basically a watermelon that has a uh, no pink flesh and all rind. It's basically solid rind. And these were sliced and these were pickled. Uh, barberries were pickled, uh, sort of similar to cranberries, which were pickled. And you're sort of thinking, well, what did they do with all these? Well, just think about the diet in the dead of winter. What were they eating? Uh, dried or salted beef. It was probably gray and probably had to be boiled. So you have a nice platter of gray boiled beef. <laughs> what do we have for veggies? Well, um, maybe some boiled cabbage and some boiled potatoes. This meal needs something, right? <laughs> And something that was maybe brightly colored, a little tangy, a little sweet, a little herbal, a little spicy to arrange around that pretty bleak looking gray boiled platter of glop might not be a bad thing. And that's what these pickles were for, trying to stimulate appetite in a time when you would sit down and look at that food and think that eating this stuff is the last thing I want to do. Uh, you know, those of you, uh, those of you who remember Ethan Frome from the way back when, you know, think about that red glass pickle dish, and she took it down, and she was going to put some pickles in that dish and liven up that meal, right? That's what these pickles were for. Um, big fad surrounding imported mangoes. So the sailing ships would arrive in Boston with all these mangoes, and these mangoes would all ripen at roughly the same time. I mean, there's just so much mango you can eat, right? So in a mango, you have that big seed, uh, and that would be removed. Now we've got this hollow space. So um, housewives would take these, pack that hole with herbs and spices, honestly, whatever they had, right? This was not the time to be picky. You know, whatever whole herbs and spices they had, they would pack it in that hole, tie the mangoes up with some sort of thread or twine, and float them in apple cider vinegar. And that was called mangoing. And mangoing became a fad that involved every herb and spice that was available. In fact, just 
gaze at all those herbs and spices, those were all used in making pickles. When you go through these cookbooks and you look at the pickling herbs and spices, whatever was available. Uh, herbs and spices, if you fling open your cupboard or your drawer where you keep your herbs and spices at home, every single plant in that drawer is antibiotic at some level. They may not be broad spectrum antibiotics, but if you get enough of them in there, it will kill anything of a microbial nature. Any fungus or bacteria that tries to grow, if you mix all that stuff together, will be dead at the end of the day. And that was what, that was what they did. Um, one of the most potent were any of the alliums, uh, the, the chives, the scallions, the green onions, the whole onions, the garlic. Uh, they contain the compound, com compound allicin. And so you see a lot of onions being put into pickles, um, a lot of onions being chopped up or garlic being chopped up and put inside the mangoes. The, the active compound there, allicin, uh, is sulfur containing and it is, it is strongly antibiotic to the extent that um, various alliums and onions and garlics were actually used as part of bandaging uh, in both the first and second uh, world wars to prevent, um, prevent sepsis and wounds before antibiotics. Um, 19th century saw the development of a lot of specialized serving ware for pickles. Women took a tremendous amount of pride in homemade pickles because this was prior to the Pure Food and Drug Act in the early 1900s. And um, if you were to buy a pickle or pickles, they often were tainted. Uh, they often contained copper sulfate, which made the color a little brighter. And you just did not trust them. They, they were one of these spooky foods that where you could not trust the manufacturers. And so women took great pride in making their own pickles and hence the, the marketing of all kinds of special casters and pickle forks and all this sort of thing. Um, cabbages. Uh, cabbages really are another area of pickling because cabbages have their own little on-site bacteria that produce an acid which prevents a shredded cabbage from decaying. Uh, so cabbages were grown to enormous size. You know, today you go to the supermarket, a cabbage might be nine inches in diameter, and that's a big one. Uh, 19th century cabbages were grown bigger than the size of a man's head. And uh, they were just grown on and grown on. And then they were turned into shredded cabbage. So on the surface of the cabbage leaf, you have lactic acid bacteria. Some were spheres, some were rods. They all produce lactic acid. You shred the leaves of cabbage, you pack them in. Uh, you can broadcast some salt in there, which will help to draw the liquid out. But the lactic acid then forms, it goes into the liquid between the layers of the cabbage. And this thing basically self-preserves its lactic acid bacteria. So this was sort of another area of pickling uh, that resulted in the formation of sauerkraut, which could be kept in a crock and used again to brighten up meals. Uh, you can see a lot of herbs and spices being used in meat pies. Why is this? Well, most families uh, would slaughter animals sometime in the fall, uh, make up a lot of meat pies from the scraps of meat. Now, this was before refrigeration or freezers or anything like that, so the pies would be made, they would be put on shelves, some homes actually had a pie room, um, and the pies would freeze in November but then the pies would defrost and the pies would refreeze and the pies would defrost and they would still eat them and not die. What is the one thing we hear, you know, if your home freezer defrosts throughout all the meat, especially ground meat. These pies were made with so many herbs and spices that nothing of a bacterial nature could grow in them. <laughs> and when you look through the recipes, one common thread is the use of nutmeg. So, right there, contains a compound called meristocin, which is quite hallucinogenic. And some of the recipes call for one or two whole nutmegs per pie. And all I have to say is people must have had some unbelievable dreams <laughs> after eating this. And that's all I'll say. Um, Bell's seasoning, old New England tradition, right? And, 
we start creeping into October, we see the display of bells, seasoning. And again, this is something that stems from this antibiotic herbal use. So another sort of food besides the pie, which has a lot of surface area and can really grow bacteria as any kind of a meat stuffing, right? You've got a lot of surface area there. It is exposed to bacterial activity just from the air and the kitchen certainly aren't sterile. And then you pack it inside a carcass where there might be more bacteria. And just think of the opportunity that you have to culture bacteria on all that food surface area inside these carcasses. Probably never want to eat a turkey again after this discussion. Well, anyway, <laughs> Bell's seasoning. What does it contain? Here are the herbs. Um, rosemary, sage, mushroom, thyme, and ginger. Uh, the first three are all in the mint family. The last one is in the ginger family. I remember I told you that that epithet, officinal or officinara, means uh, medicinal. So rosemary, medicinal. Salvia, medicinal. Uh, marjoram, it's also the same genus as oregano. Vulgar, doesn't mean it's vulgar, it means it's common. Thyme is common and the gingerbread, ginger, officinal, medicinal. There they all are. There's the turkey. So basically these were a bunch of common medicinal herbs that were then being mixed in with food to keep people from foodborne illnesses. And you know, we don't think of it now, we think of it now as flavoring but it really stems from that connection between culinary practices and disease prevention. Because if you didn't have these herbs, people would have died, and it's just that simple. So it became a tradition, right? If you want to live, this is how you flavor your pies and your stuffing. Uh, okay, so we're going to leave all the medicinal and mosaic, sorry, leave all the medicinal and culinary aside and just sort of take a quick tour now through. Uh, a few other household plants. Uh, horsetails, most of us have seen these. Uh, they're widely regarded as living fossils. They predate the dinosaurs. They have a high silica content, uh, which you see down here on their external cells. And these were used as scouring reeds, sort of the precursor of the Brillo pad. You gather up a handful of these. They grew in wet areas along stream beds, and women collected them, brought them home. And if you had a pod, a cauldron, whatever you had that had to be scoured out, you used the horsetails. Uh, Dipsicus teasel grows wild in New England. This was brought over from Europe. It was actually used to raise the nap on woven cloth. So if you were weaving and you had wool and then you wanted to raise the nap and make it a little bit more attractive, you used teasel. And then this was actually used uh, to make entire heads that rotated in some of the mills. So this eventually became sort of a mill plant as well. And then so forth, Saponaria officinalis, also originally medicinal, uh, was in fact a soap substitute. It's in the carnation family. Uh, it contains compounds called saponins. Uh, if you break the leaves up in water, you can actually work a lather up uh, from the leaves of this plant based on these saponins. Uh, it's one of the plants that was widely collected in England during World War II as a medicinal plant from uh, the hedgerows when there were no there were no available pharmaceutical drugs because they were getting all their pharmaceutical drugs from Holland and once the Nazis occupied Holland they weren't sharing pharmaceutical drugs and so the British ended up going back to this old world herbalism and collecting a lot of, of native um, native er herbs for medicinal uses. Um, Soport also has had alternate uses for venereal diseases and was widely used for venereal diseases um, before antibiotics. Um, here in New England, it was used as a soap, basically, to cut the lanolin uh, on sheep's wool. So the natural lanolin had to be cut to remove it when you were cleaning fleece. And that's why soapport was brought here, and that's how it was used in American homes. Uh, broom corn. So that was the original broom, a withy type broom made of twigs. They were not good. They were not effective. Um, they were dropping bits of twigs all over the place. And women didn't like them. They were an annoyance, but that's what they had. And um, Benjamin Franklin 
went to France and saw a new type of broom. Um, and it was made from broom corn. Broom corn is sorghum. It's the same plant that is pressed to get a, a liquid that is boiled down into sorghum syrup, which is sort of like molasses. It's very popular in the South. Uh, Franklin surreptitiously removed a few of the seeds from a little whisk broom that he was shown, brought them home, and this was the introduction of broom corn into the U.S. And uh, it was first grown on a really large scale uh, west of here in Hadley, Massachusetts, and that sort of became the broom corn uh, center of New England. And uh, the thing that's nice about broom corn brooms is that they can be stitched flat and they don't break apart, and that's probably what we all have at our houses right now. Uh, flax. Flax was grown here in New England as a um, source of uh, a fiber for weaving, linen. Uh, there were big fiber shortages. At different points, it was illegal to actually bury a body with clothing because there were such fiber shortages. Um, American newspapers were actually importing American mummies as a source of linen, which could be converted into paper which is why a lot of newspapers from the early 19th century, late, 20th, late 18th century, look kind of brown because you have all of the oils and other preservatives that were in the Egyptian mummies actually in the body of the newspaper. Uh, flax had also uses for making floor cloths. And even the oil that was used on floor cloths to seal them was from flax, that was linseed oil. Um, we don't have time for a big discussion of dye plants, uh, but you can see some of them here. Oak, onion, weld, matter. Cochineal is not a plant. Cochineal is actually a, an insect from South America, but woad and indigo. Most natural dyes, you know, if you go out and collect plants and pulverize the roots and you get a dye, are going to be in the yellow to dull green to dull brown end of the palette. And so it was always very exciting when something like matter or indigo came along and you got a really bright color. Uh, this, un this involved quite a bit of chemistry, pH of the water, and uh, the use of mordants. Um, a lot of women used urine, rusty nails to enhance color and make color less fugitive because many of these dyes had to be reapplied each year. So if you had a nice bonnet, and it was lined with rose color, pink, maybe from matter. You would have to unpick all that stitching, take the lining out, re-dye it, stick it back in, and, and stitch it all back in place if you wanted to have that rosy glow around your face. And so anything you could do chemically by using urine or a rusty nail to keep that dye in place rather than fading or disappearing uh, was all the better. Uh, one of the most interesting uh, dye plants here in New England was alkanet. And this became widely cultivated in colonial gardens. And if you want to see it cultivated, the Carroll Garden in Dover, Mass, has some beautiful stands of alkanet. That was a garden uh, in Dover that was cultivated by uh, the women in the family of a local minister, which was so often the case. It was the minister's wife and daughters who practiced a lot of this herbal medicine. But um, this is a little Mediterranean plant. It's a relative of the forget-me-not, which I think you can tell. And it yielded colors in the violet to mauve area of the spectrum. And um, everything from a low pH all the way to a high pH, which was more the blue, the low pHs, the acids were more of your reds. But what it also was used for was killing staphylococcus infections. And so if you had a nasty boil on your hand and you had your hand in the dye water, you noticed the next day the boil was gone. And I think it was known first as a dye, but, and then secondarily uh, recognized for its ability to cure skin infections. And these colors, the mauves, became particularly valuable as you get into Victorian era mourning tradition because the Victorians dressed in black when they were in mourning, and then gradually began to move into the mauves and the purples and the lavenders. And so if you could dye cloth with anything that resembled a mauve or a lavender, all the better. And so uh, before the invention of chemical dyes, these were valued. 
So wrapping this up here, a few more slides, a few more slides. Um, hey, this is where I grew up, my hometown, Arlington. And I grew up on the shore of Spy Pond, right here. So um, there were train tracks there, and I lived to tell about it. Uh, this was before they invented child abuse or fear in mothers. And uh, I would go to the end of our cul-de-sac and let myself down over the train tracks. I think I was three. The parents were trusting souls. And there were farmers down there. And I knew all the farmers, and that's how I became a botanist. And these are the plants that I learned. And they were all plants that come from this tradition. Uh, top right, chicory. We didn't talk about this today, but chicory was a coffee substitute, had some medicinal herb uses. Comfrey, just below. We also, that's another one I didn't talk about today, but the European tale about comfrey was that you could chop up a piece of meat, throw it in a pot, throw in a handful of comfrey, and the meat would reheal itself back into a solid piece of meat. And it was, it was used for healing wounds. Does it work? I think it does. Is it dangerous? It also is dangerous because it contains uh, uh, hepatotoxic pyrolizidine alkaloids. Uh, comfrey used to be in all of the celestial seasoning, almost all the celestial seasoning tea mixtures until a couple of celestial seasoning customers needed liver transplants. And then the company just quietly removed it. They didn't have a news conference, they just took it out. Um, <laughs> The, uh, oh, I'm sorry, you know, I was looking at this wrong. If chicory is on the top right, comfrey is on the lower left, I misspoke. It's soap work right below the, uh, the chicory, and then you recognize uh, the universal vermifuge there, tansy. So what were all these plants doing there? So, you know, this was a colonial town. Arlington, not that I'm bitter, but Arlington gets a little less press than, say, Lexington and, um, or Concord. Uh, but, it, you know, this is a... Paul Revere rode through Arlington. It was actually the Dawes sisters were my next door neighbors when I was a little girl. And the um, bloodiest battle of the war was in Arlington. Right. Thank you for pointing that out. Not that we're bitter. But anyway, <laughs> all of these were colonial era plants that women had brought with them, uh, right where we started this lecture, you know, bringing things from England that you think you might need one day. And by Jove, they're still self propagating and living on the shores of this, this uh, little lake. So I, I don't have a seamless segue into this, but the last couple of slides show you headstones and how much botanical, how much botanical symbolism shows up on headstones in New England. So what have we got here? Uh, the top two are ivy, the idea that you're clinging, um, clinging love, clinging affection. Uh, lower left. Uh, the weeping willow. Uh, right in the center of the lower three, a tree trunk carved in stone showing that life has been cut short. And especially for a middle-aged person, one that wasn't quite ready to die yet but did die, uh, the tree trunk was a common headstone. And then lower right, ferns. So what was it with ferns? Um, you know, there was the big fern fad and that started in England, the pteridomania. Ferns showed up everywhere. There were fern books, fern albums, fern herbaria, fern cast iron furniture, fern urns, you name it, it was fern. And so ferns also did show up on headstones. And then um, quite a few uh, very fragrant plants because disease was not understood. And it was thought the disease was spread by miasma, bad smells, swampy smells, miasma of disease, and that fragrant plants counteracted disease. And so roses in the center, lily of valley on the right, and some sort of a generic lily over on the left. So let me see. So in a moment of blatant self-promotion, <laughs> I have written a few books. Um, one of them actually is called American Household Botany. And if you want to know more, read it. And then if you're curious about the chemistry and the role of medicinal plants in nature, the Natural History of Medicinal Plants,
months. And then when I jettisoned my full-time job a few years ago, I started pursuing the point of connection between warfare and botany. Notice the references today to poison gases and garlic bandages and all of this. And I published Plants in the Civil War. That came out actually right before around Thanksgiving last year. And that was interesting. And it is a companion, uh oh, I just do there. It is a companion volume to one I published in 2019 about um, botanical connections with um, World War II. So that is it. Tell me if you have a question or a complaint, and I'll try to answer. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs>